Hey everybody, Harv here. Let's rock and roll and let's talk about World War II. So, World War II is just insane. Um, and it is super interesting. Interesting. It's a topic that originally got me into history. Both of my grandfathers fought in World War II. One of them died. Um, and I just find it so fascinating because it was so recent. Um, it, it's 2020 this year. Um, you know, it was roughly 80 years ago. Um, so it, it's just it's just, it's so it's so fresh in the uh, in the kind of the, uh, the the relative history of the world. Um, we still have people alive today who experienced it, who was there in some of these, you know, in some of these key events, key battles. Um, and it's just, it's a fascinating topic. So let's talk about it, okay? Um, the insanity of World War II can really be summed up with the atomic bombs. I mean, we're going to see destruction like no other in this war. I mean, uh, we're going to see with Hiroshima and Nagasaki where this um, picture symbolizes the, the use of the atomic bombs with the Americans bombing um, Japan to get them out of the war. Um, just, you know, destruction on a new level. You know, we, you know, I always make the argument that World War I was worse than World War II. And I make that just because of the, the sheer slaughter in terms of how you saw the men running the machine guns. But World War II is definitely a more destructive war. Um, and more people will die. Um, but I mean, it's just the technology has reached, you know, heights of now where one bomb can destroy an entire city and just vaporize people. Um, so it, it, that's that's where we're going to get you in in World War II. I mean, we're going to see battles in World War II that are just going to be. It's hard to even put into words how 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 crazy and insane they are. Stalingrad. I mean, it's just it's the, the fighting, the brutality, the um the destruction and the loss of uh, life is just going to be out of control. But when you talk about what's uh you know what's going to start this war and um what goes down with it, so. World War II, ladies and gentlemen, lasts about six years. Um, now, there's really uh, two, kind of two interpretations of this. Some historians believe that World War II actually starts in the early 1930s when the Japanese invade Manchuria and China. Um, that that aggression kind of symbolized the start of the war. Um, but for the context of our European history course, uh, we're going to start when Germany invades Poland in 1939, September 1st. Um, World War II is unquestionably the most destructive human conflict in human history. Um, an important note about World War II is it is going to directly facilitate, facilitate our next war that we're going to need to talk about in Chapter 21, uh, the Cold War. Okay, um, And it's going to end with um, the controversial rise of our nuclear age, um, nuclear arms, and the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which we will talk about Um to a large extent, okay? Very controversial um, bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's really um, two sides, two arguments about the, the, those bombings, but we're gonna talk about, um, we are gonna talk about the controversy surrounding that bomb, those, those bombings, okay? So, um, you know, once more, we gotta talk about causes. Once more, we are on the road to war. Woo, didn't we just cover World War One? Yeah, all right. Well, in Germany, uh, because of the Great Depression, because of the Treaty of Versailles, because of that humiliation that Clemenceau, Wilson, um, David Lloyd George, Orlando signed off on with the Treaty of Versailles, Germany is upset, and we know who's in charge, Mr. Adolf Hitler. Um, and, so, and so the world is really um, in for quite the surprise when Hitler, H Hitler um, you know, goes off. Um, but it wasn't surprising to one person. And remember, that was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, uh, who, who read Mein Kampf, uh, was very much against Hitler. Very, very much against Hitler. And he was he's going to be he's going to know what's coming, and he's going to say, "Uh oh, we're in trouble." And he read his book. He read Mein Kampf. He read his book, and he knows what's coming. Um, but in response to all that's gone wrong in Germany, Germany ha now has a new leader, and that is. Uh, Adolf Hitler. Okay, and he's in power, and he is going to want to run World War One back. Okay, he is going to, um, you know, be really at the epicenter of all this. He's really going to be the main aggressor. He is going to use the Treaty of Versailles as a source of sympathy with the German people. He's going to use the Treaty of Versailles as really um, a source for all of his aggression, and um, 
and the people will be following him. And remember, the people are going to be following him as we talked about in chapter 19 because, number one, he's given them food. He's, he's got the, the economy back on track by, rebuild, by rebuilding the um, military. People have jobs. People have food, paycheck. They're, 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 uh, they're happy. And if they're happy, they're going to... Um, they're gonna they're gonna put up with Hitler, okay. Um, but another another uh, key issue that we're gonna be talking about is just the failure of so many collective agreements, peace talks, appeasement, um, the failure of people to deal with Hitler, um, and we'll talk about that, okay. So obviously, one key source of World War II is gonna be the failure of Versailles. It was, we, and we talked about in class how flawed this peace treaty was. It was truly flawed, um, and it, it and and it was flawed because you, of how much pain it inflicted upon Germany. It was not a treaty of reconciliation. It was not a treaty of peace. It was a treaty of revenge, and because of this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Germany is upset. Okay, Germany is very, very, very upset, and that's going to, um, that's going to be obviously apparent with, with Hitler. Okay, the reparations, that war guilt clause. All right, it, it, it was it was flawed. It was a flawed treaty. Also, a big flaw within the Treaty of Versailles was the League of Nations, which was a part of that treaty. And a big flaw within the League of Nations is that there's there's not a lot of power behind it in the form of the United States, who didn't join because of Henry Cabot Lodge and his dislike for Woodrow Wilson, but also that they never invited the USSR, and they didn't invite the USSR because they were afraid of the communists. Okay, Little do, little do France and Britain and some of these uh, Western countries know that they're going to need the Soviet Union in World War II, big time. A lot of the heavy fighting is going to go on the Eastern Front. Okay, so uh, just a failed peace treaty. We're going to see this uh, Washington Naval Conference from 1921... 21 to 1922, it's not going to be able, it's not going to stop a naval arms race between um, the West and Japan. Um, it's going to, um, it's, 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 it's really actually going to exacerbate problems. All right. There was this treaty, um, this five power treaty between the US, Britain, and Japan, which is going to create a 553 battleship ratio. But one of the big problems with this is that it's not going to take into account ships other than the battleship, mainly the aircraft carrier, which is going to be the new weapon used in World War II. Okay, um, the Five Power Treaty, ladies and gentlemen, um, and the, one of the reasons why you're having these naval treaties. Well, if we remember in World War One, a, a key reason of why World War One popped off was that naval arms race between Germany and Britain. Well, they're trying to prevent a naval arms race, but one of the problems is Japan just doesn't care. Japan's like, you know, whatever. And, and they're also focusing on the wrong ships. Aircraft carriers are, 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 are important. We're going to see battles in World War II, especially the Battle of Midway. There's going to be no, there's going to be no ships won't even be close to one another. But there's going to be heavy fighting. It's because it's going to be all done with airplanes. Okay, and we're going to see the failure of the other, the, some of these other agreements. The Carnal Pact. It was an agreement of Europe, Europeans for European nations to resolve problems peacefully. Yeah, psych. Okay. Uh, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, all right, renouncing war. Yes, yeah, psych. Okay, all these things are going to fail. Okay, all of them fail. All right. Now, let's talk about what Hitler wanted. A lot of people will say, oh, Hitler, world conquest. No, that's not really. If you read Mein Kampf, okay, which Winston Churchill did, Winston Churchill knew exactly what, uh, what Hitler wanted. Okay, and he, and he was really, he wasn't hiding what he wanted. Okay, he wrote it in a book and published it. So he wasn't really, you know, hiding behind what he wanted. And it, this really just shows you the silliness of a lot of the Western nations to take him at his word. There was no hiding his motivations. Now, he, he he is going to, you know, play people, okay? He's definitely going to play people into kind of getting what he wants, but Hitler always had uh, the same motivations, all right? Uh, one of his primary motivations was to unify all German people in what he considered Germanic lands. And now that was up to debate, right? There's certain territory in Poland that Hitler considers Germanic, that Poland considers Polish, right? And that's where there's going to be some of the problem. Same thing in Czechoslovakia, Austria, right? Um, so Hitler wanted to unite all the German people, okay? And he and what's important if, and is one of the things that is important about Hitler is he wants to unite all people, um, including Austria, which is different, right? If you all remember Grossdeutsch versus Kellindeutsch, right? Excluding Austria versus including Austria, you should know that term. Okay, or excuse me, know, know the difference between those term, two terms, all right? Remember, Otto von Bismarck did not want to include Austria. Um, Hitler does want to include Austria. So that's a difference between the two, all right? Um, 
Another thing that Hitler wanted was called Liebenstrom, all right? And he wanted to have some extra room um, to live. Um, and what he wanted was what in this Liebenstrom is he wanted territory in the east and he wanted to take it from Russia. Russia, Slavic, he considered them an inferior people. And well, Hitler considered a lot of people inferior to him. He was very racist, right? Very anti-Semitic, okay? Um, so he wanted to clear the the east out of what he considered inferior people and give territory to what he considered a superior people, the Aryan race and his own people, okay? The German people, all right? And he wanted land from Ukraine and Poland, all right? Now, we're going to see one of the first things that Hitler does that represents a failure of the League of Nations. He's going to start to rearm. Remember, Germany wasn't allowed to have an army. Well, Hitler's going to say, uh, psych. And in, in 1933, he's going to withdraw from the League of Nations. He's going to try to be cool with Poland, all right? But we all know that he doesn't want to be cool with Poland. If you read Mein Kampf, Winston Churchill's looking at that like, okay, yeah, yeah, non-aggression pact, really, all right? Um, and by 1935, we're going to see Hitler formally renounce a disarmament of the Treaty of Versailles, and he's going to soon rebuild the army. And Hitler's doing this for two purposes. One, to rebuild the economy and gain support for the people, but two, get ready for war. Hitler is ready for World War II, ladies and gentlemen. He's getting ready for it four years in advance. And that's one of the reasons why he's going to be so successful. He's going to get a head start on everybody. He is getting ready for this, all right, from, from the get-go. And it is just unbelievable how the Allied powers aren't, aren't on this. Winston Churchill is. He knows what's going on. Winston Churchill read his book. But the rest of but France and Britain and the leaders in charge at that time really lackadaisical, really not. And, and part of the reason why they're so lackadaisical, I, I forget – um, and I want to point out is that they don't want to fight a war. World War One was awful. They have suffered. People are still scarred from that war, um, physically and mentally. They don't want to fight. The only country that really wants to fight, Germany. Hitler wants to fight. Okay, the other countries don't want to fight. Um, and so uh, this is one of the reasons why we're going to see them fail so badly. Okay, um, so Hitler is going to renounce the Treaty of Versailles. And what, one theme that we're going to see when Hitler, Italy, and Japan kind of have all these acts of digression is that the League of Nations is not going to do anything. They're going to be worthless. They're going to be useless. They're going to say, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, you no, you can't do that. No, 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 you can't do that. All right, but they're going to do nothing. They're going to be all bark, no bite. Okay, and this was a very similar thing um, that we saw with Japan in China. The League of Nations is like, no, you can't do that. No, no, you're not supposed to do that, Okay. And they're not going to do anything. And the reason why, one of the reasons why they're not going to do anything is because Britain and France, they don't want to fight it out. Okay? And the United States isn't involved. Neither is Russia. All right? So you don't, you have, you're, you, there's some key pieces missing from the League of Nations. An important event that we see early on that's kind of foreshadowing this tension that's going to lead uh, uh, to World War um, II, ladies and gentlemen, is Mussolini is going to attack Ethiopia. Now, Mussolini does this for uh, a number of reasons. Number one is he wants to avenge the defeat that we saw with new imperialism, okay, in the 1800s. Uh, but two is Mussolini, right, is trying to create his own, like, new Roman Empire and show that Italy is really important and really powerful. And so there's a couple motivations why Italy does this. One of the things that's really important about this is that France and Britain are going to appease him, okay, in the hope that Italy will, you know, be on their side and be cool and offset Germany's power. All right, and they offered him control of Ethiopia. Mussolini is going to ignore them completely and say whatever. All right, um, but France and Britain are not going to do anything in the League of Nations. And Hitler's looking at that like, okay, all right, looks like I can get a little uh, get away with a little bit more than I thought. All right, and Hitler's going to start to get more and more bold in his approaches, bold in how he is going to, um, you know, deal deal with things all right and again this is just showing the league of nations like oh no you can't do that no japan no germany no no italy you can't do that stop 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 and they're they're just you know hitler and mussolini um in japan are kind of just looking at the league of nations saying okay and what are you gonna do about it nothing that's what we thought all right so it's a big problem one of the big acts of aggression that we're gonna see hitler and uh, uh initiate will be uh when he remilitarizes the rhineland now Remember, the Rhineland is the western border, um, kind of with Belgium, France, Netherlands, all right? 
Um, and so Mussolini's success convinced Hitler that he could do this, and he is going to uh, he's going to go into that demilitarized zone and remilitarize it. And France and Britain are like, "Oh no, you can't do that." And Hitler's going to say, "What are you going to do about it?" And they're just they're not going to do anything. The League of Nations won't do it. And we're going to see the West see start to you know sense that things are kind of getting tense. Things are kind of getting a little out of hand. All right, all right. Um, and they're going to start to respond with appeasement. Now, make sure, ladies and gentlemen that we know that term, okay? Appeasement is really, 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 really important for us, okay? So make sure that we know that term, all right? It's the idea of making a concession to avoid a war. So we're going to start to see the West go, look, Hitler, okay? We get it, all right? You want some stuff, all right? Can we give you what you want? Will you promise not to start a full-out war? And Hitler's going to look at them and say, oh, for sure, that's all, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. No, I don't want a war. <laughs> Who said anything about war? What? <laughs> what? What? No, man. And and so and so the West is going to start saying, okay, cool. Now, Winston Churchill, when Neville Chamberlain, and we start to see some countries do this, Winston Churchill is going to be like, oh my gosh, what are you all doing? Read his book. Read the book. And so... But the, we're going to start to see, all right, that they're going to start to make concessions to avoid a war. And and also, you had some people in in Britain, especially, not necessarily France, but definitely in Britain, who felt that Germany had some grievances. They, they, they definitely felt that the Treaty uh, of Versailles was a little too harsh and they needed to, you know, help Germany out a little bit. Okay? So, we as we see, the clouds are kind of gathering for a full-out war. Now, okay, we're going to see kind of a foreshadowing and precursor with the Spanish Civil War. Spanish Civil War is important for a couple of reasons, all right? One is we are going to see another fascist regime with Francisco Franco, okay? But two, this is going to be a, a battleground where the Germans are going to start testing out their new tactics that are going to allow them to be so successful. This is where they start testing out their blitzkrieg, okay? Um, so this is a war that broke out between um, the fascists, okay, uh, and a Republican government. Um, Italy and Germany are going to support the uh, the fascists. All right, we're going to see the Soviets support the, uh, the these Republicans. Okay, and the, the democracies are going to stay out of it. Now, why is the Soviet Union going to get involved? Well, the Soviet Union, remember, if you remember back to chapter nineteen, is the ideological enemy of fascism. So, if, if Germany and Italy are going to get involved and try to create another fascist government, that's bad for the Soviets. Soviets don't want fascism; they want communism. All right, so they're going to try to do whatever it takes and not join the war and start a huge brawl or anything like that. But they're going to they're going to they are going to support um, the anti-fascists. They're going to support these Republicans. OK, um, the fascists will win. All right. But it, what's really important for this is this is where the Germans, their generals, OK, are going to see that their new tanks, their equipment, especially their planes are going to be um, very effective. And this is a training ground for their weapons and tactics called the Blitzkrieg, which we'll talk about. Um, uh, one weapon that was devastating in the Spanish Civil War was the, was the dive bomber, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about how the dive bomber is used in, um, in World War II and how effective it is, okay? But we now have, we're going to see um, that Hitler's weapons, his tactics are ready to go, okay? And by 1936, we have a new alliance. If you go back to the uh, uh, World War One, remember we had the Triple Alliance, Triple Entente. You should know those alliances. We have a new alliance, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, it is called the Axis. Okay, it is called the uh, the. Um, you can remember it by Jig. It's also called the Rome Berlin Tokyo Axis. All right, but I remember this Axis uh, this Axis alliance simply by saying Jig, Japan, um, Italy, and Germany. Okay, um, and you had a um, Republican government versus Franco. There's Franco, there's Stalin, there's Hitler, there's Mussolini. All right, you kind of have the the, the the opposing sides. Okay, now um, here's a picture from uh, Guernica by Picasso. There was, this was a terrible bombing in the Spanish Civil War that killed a lot of people. Um, uh, and in this this picture was a representation by Picasso, it horrified Picasso. He was so he was so devastated when he when he uh, learned of this. Um, this was just a terrible event. But um, 
this this is going to show the new um, atrocities and the new power of some modern weapons that we're going to talk about. Okay, terrible, terrible. And you can see the, just the suffering depicted in this painting. All right, and here's a painting that kind of, or excuse me, a um, picture image that illustrates the um, the uh, developments of our um, of our Spanish Civil War. Okay, and how Franco uh, slowly um, but surely took over Spain. Okay, and a propaganda picture from um, from the war. Okay, now, man, um, about a year before the uh, war breaks out, we are going to see um, some serious moves be made. Number one is Hitler is going to take Austria, and we are going to see that that union of Germany and Austria, which they are going to call in uh, the nineteen uh, late nineteen thirties Anschluss. But we know there's another term for it. Go back in your notes and look for that, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, there's two. There's there's a couple terms that we should know: Kimmin Deutsch versus Grossdeutsch. I want you to to look at which one this is, okay? But we see Hitler, in contrast with Otto von Bismarck, he is going to combine Germany and Austria, all right? Um, now, Hitler is going to do this for a key reason, all right? He is getting ready to provoke Czechoslovakia. He's getting ready to get aggressive with them, all right? Um, a country that he, he, he wanted some territory from, all right? Now, okay, we're going to see in 1938, Hitler is going to put a lot of pressure on... Uh, this new country of Czechoslovakia. Um, and Hitler wants a special piece of land. It's called the Sudetenland. Let me see if I can go look at a map real quick. Ah, there it is. Okay. Hitler wants this Sudetenland. All right. Where he, where there, I guess there's about 3 million Germans that live there. All right. I'm not sure of the number, but there was a big German population there. And Hitler wants that territory. So Hitler is going to say, hey, we want this territory. All right. Now, the Allies are going to react with this um, with appeasement. And there you can look. Austria has already been annexed and taken by Germany. Ah, let's go back. Okay. So, um, we are going to see um, we are going to see Hitler get really aggressive and he wants the Sudetenland. And we're going to see Neville Chamberlain from Great Britain. He's going to go um, it, with, these, with this Munich conference, try to calm Hitler down. Okay, and he's gonna he's gonna end up meeting with Hitler and some other European leaders and try to appease him and avoid a war. Okay, and he's gonna give Hitler what he wants with the promise. Okay, Hitler, you pinky promise, you pinky promise not to start World War II, you pinky promise Hitler's gonna be like, Yeah, for sure, I got this. Yes, of course, man. Absolutely. I'm a man of my word. And Winston Churchill's in Parliament going ha going, I read his book. No, he's not. You can't negotiate with him. No, 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 no. But Neville Chamberlain is going to be like, all right, I believe you. And he's going to give up Czechoslovakia. Many historians believe that if Neville Chamberlain had been firm and backed up Czechoslovakia and said, no, you may not have this, that, that World War II, uh, that Germany, that World War II would not have been as devastating as it had. That with a strong Czechoslovakia and Poland, Britain and France that Germany would just would have been outnumbered and that war would have been much different. But Neville Chamberlain, he is going to give up Czechoslovakia and eventually we're going to see Hitler, um, okay, just take over the rest of it, okay? So we're going to see with, with this Munich conference, all right, Hitler's demands are going to be met. He gains control of the Sudetenland, okay? He promised no more territory demands in Europe. Yeah, psych, all right? Uh, and, ne and Neville Chamberlain was going around Europe going, hey, I have brought Peace for our time. I have brought peace with honor. I have brought peace. There's going to be no war. We're good. No war. No war. I'm the man. No Chamberlain got off the plane. He's like, I'm the man. I'm the man. Woo! All right? No. Not the case. All right? Winston, Ch Winston Churchill was looking at him like, you are a clown, bro. All right? Straight up. And this is going to be the failure of appeasement. Hitler's just going to take the rest of Czechoslovakia. He's just going to end up taking it without a fight, without having to fire a bullet. Okay? All right, without having to, you know, without having to fight a whole, uh, a whole on war. All right, um, and this is the, and that just shows, illustrates the failure of appeasement. And th here's a picture of Neville Chamberlain getting off the plane, you know, waving around the agreement. I'm the man. Woo! Not the case. Okay. And here's some pictures from the Munich Pact. All right, and it's crazy to look at these pictures. I mean, there's Hitler right there saying, "I got you, checkmate." All right. I don't know what Mussolini's looking at, but Hitler's looking at the camera. But Hitler was focused, driven. He knew exactly what he wanted. And a lot of people knew exactly what Hitler wanted because he wrote it in his book. 
Mein Kampf. All right. So Hitler gets to Sudetenland. He's going to eventually just control the rest of che Czechoslovakia. He's already got Austria. Next up, he wants Poland. All right. Why does Germany want Poland? Well, first off, you have Germany separated into two different countries. Here's Eastern Prussia and the rest of Germany. Also, Germany, Hitler considers Poland to be German territory. If we go back in our history, look in the 1700s, the partitions of Poland. There were three partitions of Poland. Remember, Austria, Prussia, Russia, they divided up Poland between themselves. So for the last couple hundred years, Poland has belonged to Germany. And Hitler firmly believes that that is German territory. He also believes that the uh, people living in those territories are inferior. So he's going to get aggressive with Poland. Okay, another picture from the Munich conference. Okay, so Hitler's going to take the rest of Czechoslovakia, all right? Um, and by spring of 1939, he's going to start making, start getting aggressive with Poland. And what he wants is Danzig. Okay, I'll go show you right here. He wants Danzig, okay? He wants to be able to connect Eastern Prussia, all right, with the rest of Germany. Now, Poland doesn't want to give that up because that's their only waterway. Otherwise, they'll be a landlocked country. So Poland does not want to give that up at all, all right? But Hitler considers that. German territory, all right? By about March, Chamberlain is going to realize that I can't negotiate with Hitler. Winston Churchill was right. You can't negotiate with the tiger, all right? Um, you can't negotiate with him, all right? And so we are going to see Churchill declare that France and Britain are going to guarantee Polish independence. You can't invade them. Well, before Hitler starts his war, he's got one last thing to do, one last thing. One last country to make sure that uh, that if he's fighting, if he's going to get in a fight with uh, with France and Britain, he's got to make sure that the Soviets are cool, okay? And we know that the Soviets and Hitler, the fascists, are ideological enemies. But they do have a commonality. Both of them want Poland. They consider that some part of their territory, all right? We know that Russia, divide, that Russia was part of those partitions of Poland. So Hitler's going to say, yo, Stalin, I got a deal for you, all right? You get part of Poland, I get part of Poland. Cool? All right, cool. If we look at the map... All right, Hitler's going to give him this eastern part right here. Hitler's going to take Hitler's going to take the west. All right, and they're going to divide it up. All right, so we're going to see them sign a pact. Hitler's going to invade. A couple days later, Britain and France are going to have to have to fulfill their guarantee, and the war is on. All right, let's talk about this uh, Nazi-Soviet pact real quickly. Okay, it was by Hitler and our other leader of the so our other leader that we talked about, Joseph Stalin. Okay. They didn't trust each other, but they did it, okay, because they didn't necessarily want to fight each other. Hitler doesn't want a two-front war that he had in World War, um, uh, that we saw in World War I. Um, he's not ready to fight the Soviets just yet. Let him deal with Britain, let him deal with France, and then he'll deal with the Soviets, okay? But Stalin didn't, didn't obviously didn't know that Hitler was getting ready to attack him. Stalin just didn't want a war in general, um, but he, but he, and he wanted to make an agreement um, with Hitler. He was also scared of Hitler. Okay, Ger Germany. He knew what was what was going on with that military. He was he was nervous about Hitler. Okay, intimidated. Here are some political cartoons talking about this very unlikely agreement. All right, not a lot of trust between the two, but they're friends. All right, right here, Poland going. Oh no, that's not good. Okay, but eventually we know that Hitler is going to stab him in the back. All right. So let's let's sum up our causes of the war, our failure of the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, that's going to help facilitate the Great Depression and uh, help facilitate our fascist leaders. The failure of appeasement of Neville Chamberlain and the failure of these collective agreements. The failure of the League of Nations, those naval treaties. Okay, the Locarno Pact, the kellogg briand Pact. But another key cause, ladies and gentlemen, okay, is the militarism of fascism. Hitler wanted a fight. Okay, and he was going to bring that fight to Europe whether they wanted it or not. Okay, we'll stop here, ladies and gentlemen, for today. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day.